All right, most of you here probably know what the issues are, so I'm going to just give a real quick summary of issues and why control or eradication is needed. Mainly want to talk around some of the tools around detection and evaluation, uh, and then also some tools around removal, some which cross into both boundaries, actually, and then a few strategies and aspects to consider to try and optimise gains. Um, very quickly, um, the problems with invasive fish, particularly in the Waikato, um, are varied. You know, the, the sort of directions in which these impacts occur um, are quite variable amongst the species. Here's a big fat catfish that's been gorging on mice and shrimp, so they're directly overlapping with diets of some other native fish, like, uh, like long finned eel, for instance. Um, these fish are generally very tolerant of poor water quality and they're also very fecund, so you have these problems of large numbers of fish um, occupying the water space at any one time and having sort of trophic level impacts. Um, so this works. One of the things about uh, koi carp was they're quite abundant um, in the Waikato system and make up a lot of biomass. There's a, fish, fish, there's a fish here that's sorting through the sediments on the bottom of the stream. It's actually pretty rare to be able to see a koi doing this because the water's generally so turbid that you can't see what they're doing. But this is one individual staring up sediment here just through its mouth action along the bottom. So you can imagine when you have very high densities and biomass of fish like this, for instance in a lake, how you can get resuspension and nutrients and a whole lot of things. So um, these fish are particularly, and it's, it's an area that hasn't really been talked about too much, but they're big energy um, transfer, they're vectors, they're highly mobile, so they're carrying a lot of um, system energy around with them and they're moving around. Um, with respect to detection and evaluation tools, um, some people have already talked about things, so I'm just going to really uh, just cover the things that I've been involved in more recently. Um, I'll talk about some stuff with barriers and counters, fish counters, some remote monitoring stuff with um, remote monitoring buoys that have been put in, um, and some remote sensing work that we've commissioned through contracts at the Council. And there's a few other uh, sort of emerging themes and, and things that we're playing around with here, like fixed um, high definition cameras and drones and a range of these other tools that I'm just really going to just quickly cover them. Um, I've hashed this one out a few times, this little thing, but it's quite good to show um, and it's not going to work. So if that was going to work, <laughs> basically it just shows carp pushing through those finger bars that you've already seen before. So um, the idea of these is to exploit the pushing behaviour of fish. Um, what we've done is taken that idea and tried to automate um, the movement or the traffic through these things so that we can get an idea of the traffic <coughs> volumes and the sorts of environmental parameters that are triggering that movement. So this is a site going into Lake Waikere. Um, these are the sorts of outputs that you can get from it. So um, up the top here is a three month plot of fish um, and what it can give you is the timing as to when large numbers of invasive fish are moving through into a lake. Um, you can look at the relationships with, for instance here, this is lake level. As soon as the lake level goes up, there was a big pulse of fish moving through. And if you've got a trap or some sort of system associated with this, um, remotely you can sort of sit at your, your office and go, oh, the trap's probably going to be full, we better go and check it out, rather than have to go out there all the time. So it's about sort of um, efficiency of resources. Um, in this case, we've just uh, opened up this plot into sort of more detail, and you can actually see here that what's happening is that the fish, when they're moving through, are actually mainly moving at night. So just as soon as it gets to dusk, off they go. So there's, there's even dieel kind of patterns in the way this, these fish are moving that can help you to understand um, ways to optimise the removal and the most productive times. So using this sort of information um, and these sorts of systems at a range of places within the lower basin can give you an idea as to whether these sort of movements that are happening in one location are also happening in a range of other places. So I think it's quite important to know that to get the spatial coverage. When you combine this sort of, these sort of tools with um, these real-time monitoring uh, types of technologies, like as Chris McBride here putting in um, the um, monitoring buoy at Lake Wahi, um, you've got a range of parameters here that you can try and correlate with the sorts of management actions that you're, you're trying to, to undertake, whether it's removal of fish or some other aspect. These sorts of tools are absolutely critical for evaluating whether or not we're being effective. Um, for instance, this is just a quick plot of turbidity, and um, turbidity on the bottom here and wind speed over the top. So one of the things you might consider is that if you've got a bottleneck going into a lake and you're trying to remove a large number of invasive fish, and you suspect that invasive 
fish are having an effect on turbidity of that water, water body. Um, if you've got a lake that's not managed and you've got a lake that is managed for carp and they've both got monitoring buoys, does your turbidity during periods of non-wind, um, relatively speaking, decrease um, in response to the removal of those fish? So it helps, I guess, to partition out the effects of each of these different stresses that are occurring. Um, one of the things that um, Kevin and Jeremy um, and a bunch of other little projects we've come with engineering dreamt up a few fun projects to work on is to um, use some of these technologies like drones from the sky. Um, for, for fish like koi carp, which are very bright in colour, um, even in quite turbid kind of environments, uh, at certain times of the, of the year when they're spawning in shallow water, you can send these sorts of devices up, potentially, and see whether you can pick up particular aggregations. And when you combine this stuff again with the monitoring information with temperature and um, chlorophyll A and these other parameters, you can start to get a better integrated understanding of what's happening within these systems without having to do a lot of the hard legwork that sort of more traditionally has occurred in the past. Um, one of the things that I think in fresh water we've been particularly poor at but uh, has been increasingly getting, been getting better in terrestrial systems is being able to evaluate, um, for instance, possum browsing on trees as an index to give an idea of when you should undertake trapping again. With fish, we've kind of just, you know, we've never really been able to kind of document those sort of things. So the idea of these things is that you can program a path, you can set an altitude, you can set a reference point, you can take a photo, you might be able to digitise a polygon, and then if you're undertaking management actions, you might see a reduction in those polygons at key areas within the lakes. So you can use these technologies together um, to not only look at the fish but also um, with remote sensing, where's the vegetation, where are the likely places that these fish are going to go for a given lake level. So you know you might be able to set up some sort of model that says at this lake height with at these temperatures at this time of year these are the vegetation areas within this lake where it's most likely going to occur for spawning and this is where we need to target our efforts. Um, this is a piece of work that Kevin um, uh, got Hannah Jones and David Hamilton from the university here to do. Again, these are technologies that are very useful. This is Lake Fongapé, um, hydrodynamic models looking at levels of inundation. Um, the dark blue line here shows the minimum water level and the, the, the uh, lighter blue one is the maximum water level. So you can automatically see the areas that you need to target for a given lake height. And again, if you digitise your vegetation and things over that, it can really help you to refine these places and use those other technologies in the sky to get that overview and maybe we start to get somewhere. Um, okay, so in, a, in, a, in addition to um, the detection and the reporting type of things, there's also the tools for removal. Um, all these things down here have been talked about already, so I'm not gonna go into them. Um, I've had a little bit of involvement with cages um, and I'll talk briefly about the um, possibility of creating purpose-built bottlenecks and natural bottlenecks. Um, so the guys in Australia have been very uh, proactive in developing different sorts of cages for trapping invasive fish, um, mainly carp. Um, they have issues over there that, uh, whereby you've got a lot of native fish that are of a similar size to carp, so you have a lot of problems with non-target captures. One of the benefits in New Zealand is that, you know, other than eels and maybe mullet, we have um, opportunities to let native fish through with minimal bycatch with these sorts of devices, um, but retain the things that, that we want to remove. So it's a, it's a big advantage for us, but it, it can vary from place to place. So in some areas we know that mullet aren't a problem, so we don't have to necessarily cater for those, but in other areas of the basin they might be moving through quite freely, so we might need to think a little bit carefully about mesh sizes and all these sorts of other things. Um, some other interesting things that also, you know, we need to get a bit of understanding of the behaviour of these fish. This white funnel here is um, it's called a banana funnel and it's a design um, that a guy over in Australia has designed, um, uh, Ivor Stewart, and it's um, when they have a, a straight out cone, these are fish here uh, on a Didson camera wanting to go into the trap but carp are quite clever fish and the way in which they sort of behave around these structures very hard to see what they're doing in turbid environments. So, you, you know, you need these sort of Didson type of technology to be able to see through turbid water, but these are all aggregating in front of the cage, not going into it. So, 
Um, they've devised these banana funnels which they find that the fish are able to use more freely and then once they're inside they really struggle to get back out. Whereas the straight, um, the normal, original funnels, the fish would actually be able to find their way back out. Um, so they'd lift the cage, see all these fish in it, drop it down and then they'd lift it up again and they were gone. So, so you know, there's, there's like teething issues around that, that that you need to kind of get on top of. Um, so they, these sorts of devices, we've put one in at Lake Waikiri, they do catch heaps of fish. Um, this is just a real quick video here of um, just a, a little run of fish coming through. Most of you have probably seen this, but um, we've removed, removed um, well, I should say removed, we've prevented 40 tonnes of uh, uh, access to Lake Waikiri in the last three years. Has that had any benefit on the lake? Go and have a look at it, it doesn't really look like it has. So, you know, Removing fish is actually pretty easy to do. Um, the problem is actually demonstrating what sort of benefit you're having from removing those fish. So, um, again, I want to sort of talk about these LIDAR and inundation models. Uh, this is uh, a flood that occurred in 2008, and you can see that um, fish like carp and catfish, they love to exploit these sort of areas. It's, a, it's, a, it's an Achilles heel, if you like. Um, eels like doing this as well. But you can see that as the floodwaters come up and those fish will push into these areas, there are all these little kind of networks and low points where those fish will eventually drain back out as those flows recede. So there's a really, um, there's really a lot of potential to structure your sampling around priority areas and to possibly even automate those sorts of gates and grills that we were talking about before so that as fish come up and you know that it hits a certain level, and you know that the fish are in there, as soon as it starts to just recede, you have an automated system that drops those gates, screens those fish, and then you can actually go in and, and, and retrieve them if they're going or close to an area that's high priority. Um, we, for instance, already use these technologies to control flooding. Uh, going into Lake Waikere, there's an automated gate there. So why not just turn that into a grill that also you know, serves the purpose of screening out the things that you don't want to go in there? All right, um, so strategies, where to focus. Um, you know, you have to keep a little bit of an open mind with this. From a council perspective, you know, we'd probably focus on SNA areas um, or other areas where we have integrated catchment management, which is more towards where the council's trying to go, get a bit more coordinated with how we're working. But there's also a range of other projects going on as part of the WRA um, and, and a whole range of other uh, projects where it might actually be useful to enable people to be part of the program in terms of uh, removing these fish. Um, there's a group uh, that's been formed um, to try and develop a pest fish strategy. It's currently before the WRA, so we'll know soon whether or not we, we, um, we, we get that, and that, that will hopefully set the platform for some of the strategies as to where some of these tools could get deployed and integrated. I've just put this up just to sort of show um, that the stars here are where we've currently got um, real-time monitoring buoys to, um, I guess, as a platform to look at um, our management actions, whether they're pest fish or otherwise. I'd really like to put one in here as well. And this area really kind of encompasses, you know, what I call the engine room of invasive fish production in the lower Waikato. So um, a lot of these sorts of tools being deployed in some of these areas that are bottlenecks going in for efficiency around here um, are probably the way to go, I think. Um, and then you can overlay your SNA maps and, and other priority projects that are going on to see where synergies exist. Um, so like I said before, um, catching lots of fish is not a hard thing to do, but what do you do with them all? So um, again, as part of this project that we've been running at Waikere, uh, we've got a thermophilic digester, we're turning them into a, a fish meal. Um, you know, lots of people like going out to catch these fish, either recreationally or, you know, and it would be, in my mind, it makes sense to have a central locality where if people want to remove those fish or get rid of those fish, why don't they bring them to a fish recycling centre and you might even be able to swap them their fish that they contribute for some, some material that they can use in their veggie garden type of thing. Um, so um, we've been looking at, it's probably a little bit different to, to what uh, Nicholas is saying um, uh, about uh, commercialisation, but the Regional Council's approach has been to try and uh, create a po positive from a negative, um, recognising that removing fish is easy, but demonstrating benefits is, is, is a little bit harder. So we've been looking into these other ideas like 
turning the invasive fish into terrestrial invasive baits. So using an invasive to control other invasives. So in this case, conurbations have helped us put together some baits for, for rats, um, chew cards for looking at other terrestrial predators. Um, at the moment, I've got Doc testing out this, this material here as um, attractive for pigs around Puriora. Um, so, you know, if we can't demonstrate a, a direct gain, maybe we can make gains in other ways with that, those organisms, whilst we get on top of the idea of what's the best way to prioritise this work. So our ultimate vision, at least from a council perspective, is to try and create a, a self-supporting invasive species program with, with key partners. Um, but, you know, we really want to sort of minimise the potential for commercialisation, mainly because it can incentivise the spread of these organisms. Um, and also, you know, the commercial aspect of, of carp control, for instance, in Australia has been going on for nearly two decades and the fish continue to expand in range and their numbers are as abundant as ever. So from a council perspective, if we try to actually ask the question, what is the benefit of supporting commercial fishing from an ecosystem point of view, the answer actually doesn't really stack up for us. So um, that's our point of view. Um, and. I think that we still need to add these existing technological infrastructures to, um, to the landscape to really improve our ability to, to make better management decisions and report on the effectiveness more particularly.